At the end of part one, we had successfully singled out the colors that we wanted to see from our original image. Now we can process that image to gather the center points of our colors. And to get its center point, what I want to do is I want to find out what's the minimum row that has one and what's the maximum row that has one. And then if I take half of the max, take away the minimum. So let's say this was 50 and this was 40. 50 take away 40 is 10. And if I take half of that, which is five away from 50, I'll end up here, which is half the distance between the maximum and the minimum row pixel. We we'll do the same for the column. And very quickly, we have an X and Y coordinate for this resolution. We do some normalizing based on the number of rows and columns this has, and now we get a zero to one value for the center location of our object. So let's add a add an execute. And every frame start, we're gonna run a piece of code that does that check. It's gonna scan all the rows up and down. It's gonna check all the columns left to right, and it's gonna tell us where it sees one and where it doesn't. This is one of the main reasons that we're reducing the resolution is because if we had 30,000 pixels to do, it would take forever and our frame rate would be nothing. But if we do it with 5,000 pixels and on a very specific check, we get, uh, we get a fairly accurate tracking system without a massive CPU hit. So the first thing I'm gonna write is I'm gonna write if me.time.frame percentage five, so that's modulus five is equal to zero, then do something. And I'm gonna wrap all my code in here. And this effectively says that every fifth frame, we want to update our location rather than every frame, which gives our script slightly more time to execute and relieves a lot of stress on our CPU. So if I test this, so you can now see it's more of a dut, 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 rather than a consistent printing 60 times a second. Okay, but what do we actually want to do in here? So the first thing we're gonna have is a source stat, which is going to be equal to operator chop to one. We're then gonna have an output, which we'll make a constant for, And we'll have X and Y in here. Output is going to be equal to operator output. So we now need to loop through every pixel in this image. So we're going to say for range for X in range dat dot num rows and for y in range dat dot num calls. And this says now in here, if I print x, y, it means that every fifth, oh, dat is not defined, source. Source, excuse me. So now if I run it, it means that every fifth frame, it will print the numerical location for every pixel. First looping through, it will do zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, etc. And then one, 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 two, one, two, etc. Okay, so now we're printing the location. All we need to do here is check to see if the value is one and then store it. So I'm gonna make two blank arrays. I'm gonna say rows is equal to nothing and calls is also equal to nothing. And I'm going to say if source x, y is equal to one, then rows dot append x and then calls dot append y. I missed a semicolon. So now every fifth frame, it's going to go through our image it's gonna see if it finds a pixel with one in it. And if it does, it's gonna add the X and Y range to our rows and columns, arrays. 
So now if I print rows, you'll see that I get a range of pixels where this belongs. And if I check, so we're currently doing the rows, we can see that 24 includes it all the way up to 32. So it's storing these pixel values in here. But we don't need all of the values. All we need are the minimums and the maximums. So I'm going to do some maths, the maths that I was explaining beforehand. So I'm going to say center x is equal to the maximum of rows. Take away the maximum of rows minus the minimum of rows divided by 2. So I'm just going to double check this. So now I have the max rows take away max rows minus min rows divided by 2. Let's check our value. So I'm going to do print center x. And we're getting 12, which isn't correct because we should be getting somewhere around 26 to 28 to 26. So it probably means that our division isn't properly taking our subtraction. So I need to add an extra range of brackets in here. And now we get 28, which definitely seems like a number that's more fitting of this middle point. It's, it's this densest line in the middle here. So now that's done, we can normalize it. And we say to normalize it, we divide it by the number of columns or the number of rows in our original image. So we say source.num rows. We wrap our main code in brackets so again so that bod mass takes effect so then we we construct our algorithm the right way and now we're left with 0.35 which seems about right because i i would guess this is about a third of the way or just over a third of the way from the top of the image we use the exact same code for the y but obviously every time it says rows we're going to change in columns so we're going to say max calls Max calls, calls divided by source dot num calls capital C. Now if I print center y, we get the value 0 0.58, which if we think calculating on a reverse loop, so it is also about two thirds of the way from the far edge. We can now place these values into our output. So I'm going to say output dot par dot value zero is equal to center x and output dot par dot value one is equal to center y i can now use these value for whatever i need but the one final stage we need to take care of so that we get an exact copy of this is we need to move them into uv space and to do that i need to minus 0 0.5 from each of the images The reason we do this is that our calculation is going from a 0 to 1 scale, but pixels inside Touch Designer work on UV, so they go from negative 0.5 to 0.5 and negative 0.5 to 0.5. So now, if I was to bring in something like a rectangle and make a nice square that is colored and give it my center, and my center, we can see that this cube is almost exactly where our shape is. If we composite the two on top of each other, so the resolution is very low, but we can see that, that our green square is now perfectly on top of our white cube. If I go into my scene and move it, if I move it in our scene, it's almost instantly able to track it again when I'm not there. And we can also see that we're still running at 60 frames per second, thanks to the addition of this modulus on our frame. One condition we do want to add for is that if our shape is no longer present inside the scene, it still renders the cube at the last location it was registered. So we'll do a condition that says if rows or if the length of the rows array is greater than zero, then do the maths. Otherwise, 
set our center point somewhere super arbitrarily far away. In this case, I'm going to say 100. Mm, it's not happy about something. Max args. Okay, yeah, so it is actually erroring because it can't see it at all. So I'm going to copy. So there we go. So now it's removed the error from our chop execute because it can't find our object in the scene. But if I reintroduce it, we can see that it instantly is able to start tracking it again. This is also able to run more than one instance at one without affecting our performance. So if I copy the same nodes and associate them with the correct objects, in this case, I'm going to change the code. So it says now chop two and output one. I then copy my rectangle as well. We can see that we're now tracking our blue object and our red object completely separately. We can even go to the length of instead of using this square to recomp in our original image. So if I introduce a composite and our rectangle and then say a top, we can see the effect. So if we comp these correctly, we can now get a full resolution version that is tracking both of our shapes. You can see when I add my hand, it does get confused because of the amount of color it adds to the scene. But for say tracking moving colored objects in a blank background, or wanting to know the number of colored objects in a scene, this is a very usable method. In addition to this method, one of the main things I always do when I'm trying to top, do top down track people as they move through a space would be the addition of the a difference node. So let's say that you don't have a black background or aren't lucky enough to have such a clear image to work with. We can bring in a cache top, add an image there and let me remove Remove my bricks, so capture the space when there's nothing in it, so I'm going to deactivate it and pulse it. And then introduce a difference. Compare our cache and our original image and plug that in instead. And now when I reintroduce my blocks, I get a perfectly clear background. So my background is actually completely black here. And it gives us a much stronger map. That's just a super useful tip for being able to see anything in a space that's not how it should be. And from here, you could go through the same process of leveling out all the colors so that everything appears white, and then add that to a blob track to super accurately track things as they move through a space. <laughs>